Our invocation, invocation will be by Pastor Jack Rose of the Calvary Revival Church. Can you come forward? Good evening. Maybe. Good evening, everyone. Let us bow our heads for a time of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we just invite your presence in this place this evening. We're praying, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would touch every heart and every mind, God, in Jesus' name. We're praying, God, that they would be led, controlled, and directed by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit of truth. I do ask your blessings, Father, tonight upon Mayor Dyer and the Vice Mayor, Father. I pray that you would touch them. I pray that you would help them. I pray that you would heal them. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that you would inspire and influence them, God, all by your spirit, Lord. I simply ask further for the prayers for the council members, God. I pray that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon them that they have not room enough to store. I pray, God, that they would do justly, Father, that they would walk in righteousness, Father, and humility as they make decisions that would impact this great city of Virginia Beach. God, you are the omniscient Father. You know everything. You're omnipresent. You're right here, right now. And you're omnipotent, all-powerful. So Virginia Beach is in your hands, Father. Move throughout this city. Meet the needs, mighty God. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Now I simply thank you for your presence here, for your power here, for your godly perspective here, God, and for your will to continue to be done through the lives of everyone that is here under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory Thank you. you well, pledge of allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Okay, thank you all. And Madam Clerk, do we have a roll call? Yes, Your Honor. All present, excluding Councilmember Rouse. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, do I have a motion for the certification of the closed session? So moved. Second. Okay, do we vote? Oh, Just one second. Vote is open. By vote of 10 to 0, you've certified the closed session and be in accordance with a motion to recess. Okay. I have a motion to approve the minutes of the informal and formal sessions of September 6, 2022, and the formal session of September 13th, 2022. So moved. Second. Okay. Vote is open. Just one second. Vote is open. Okay. Mayor, may I have your vote, please? There we go. Thank you. By a vote of 10 to 0, you've approved the minutes as submitted. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this point, we're going to do a couple mayor's presentations, and the first one is uh, for the 60th anniversary. And um, the first one, we're going to ask, uh, you know, my colleague and dear friend, uh, Councilman Holcomb, to read on less lately, less. Wait, wait. Come on down. Mayor, Mayor there's Mayor. a presentation yeah. first. There's a presentation first. Brian, oh, okay. Mr. Clark needs to come up. Oh, not a problem. They did not. Okay. You got it. Apologies. That's quite all right, sir. So good evening, uh, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, members of City Council, City Manager Juhaney, guests and residents. My name is Brian Clark, and I work in the city's communications office, and I'm here this evening filling in for my colleague, Gina Gaines-Templeton, who unfortunately couldn't be with us this evening. Tonight, I'm pleased to be here to debut for you the ninth installment of Nostalgic VB, our monthly video series highlighting snapshots in our city's history as we count down to our 60th anniversary celebration next year. 
Please join us for a look back in the not-so-distant past as Volume 9 explores years 2003 through 2007. state history. The sustained winds felled thousands of trees that trapped residents in their neighborhoods and smashed homes and vehicles, which, combined with a storm surge, had National Weather Service estimates of damage to the state and the neighborhood of $3.4 billion. That said, the $125 million spent on Operation Big Beach, the hurricane protection program to build the seawall and widen the beach, paid off. In its first major test, the Army Corps of Engineers estimated the effort spared Virginia Beach an additional $82 million in damages. Two years later, Virginia Beach faced a new threat, the 2005 Congressionally Appointed Base Realignment and Closure Commission had added Naval Air Station Oceana to the chopping block due to encroachment around the airbase. Well, Oceana to us, from an economic perspective, was our Fortune 500 company, and the economic benefits of Oceana were immeasurable. But more importantly, or maybe as importantly, is the Navy families of Oceana are woven into the fabric of this city. We put together a team of highly skilled city employees and staff members in land use matters and economic development incentives and real estate acquisitions. We sat in a room and, and planned for weeks. We only had seven months to put together a plan that I'm sure included over 50 ordinances and affected over 46,000 acres of land. And we did so in a manner that met all of BRAC's requirements and, and in fact exceeded them. We preserved an economic asset uh, to the city. Initially we were told it could never be done, but I think it turned into one of Virginia Beach's finest moments. Ultimately, the city executed a successful strategy to conform to federal requirements. Estimates at the time projected that had Oceana closed, Virginia Beach would have lost more than 12,300 military and civilian jobs and about $305 million in net tax revenue over 20 years. 2005 was also the year the city cut the ribbon on the new $206 million Virginia Beach Convention Center, which replaced the much smaller 25-year-old pavilion and welcomed the iconic 34-foot-tall King Neptune statue to the boardwalk at 31st Street Park. The Neptune Festival funded the project entirely through private contributions and commissioned Richmond artist Paul Di Pasquale to capture the King of the Sea. Following a highly successful two-year fundraising campaign, the Sandler Center for the Performing Arts opened its doors on November 3, 2007 with a performance by violin virtuoso Itzhak Perlman. Today, the Sandler Center is heralded as one of the region's most stunning structures and is among the nation's most acoustically sound arts venues. This completes our look back at Virginia Beach from 2003 to 2007. In volume 10, we'll close out the first decade of the new millennium and delve into more recent defining moments in Virginia Beach history. If you have pictures or videos you'd like to share that capture the early days of Virginia Beach or proud reflections of what makes this city your home, we would love to hear from you. 
Visit vbgov.com forward slash nostalgic VB for step-by-step -step directions on how to get those pictures and videos to us. We thank you in advance for sharing. And Brian, forgive my oversight. That was good to see. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So if you haven't seen them yet, uh, Nostalgic VB Volumes 1 through 8 are available on the city's YouTube channel, Access VB. We invite you all to subscribe, share, and come back to catch up on new content that you might have missed. I'd also like to, uh, to take a moment and acknowledge the excellent work of Anya Linka. She's the videographer and editor on this project, as well as the invaluable support of the Virginia Beach Public Library's municipal reference staff led by Amanda Brooks. They've been invaluable and so helpful in tracking down uh, historical images, video clips, and newspaper articles to help illustrate the important milestones in the history of our city. So moving on, an important part, an important component of the Nostalgic VB campaign is the Virginia Beach Diamond Award. The Diamond Award recognizes the contributions of residents who have played a significant role in shaping our city's history. Today, we'd like to honor two heavy hitters, and I will now turn it over to Councilmember Rocky Holcomb to read the first proclamation. And as he gets into place, would the Honorable Leslie L. Lilly please come forward and join me at the podium. Now, come on down, Wes. How you doing? <laughs> like the praise is right. Come on down. Welcome. Judge, before I get started, I, I got two things. I hadn't seen you out of uniform in a while. You don't have your robe on. And I think this is the first time I've, I've seen you enter a room this big and I didn't say all rise. But it's good <laughs> to have you here, Judge. It's good to be home. <laughs> Proclamation. Whereas the Honorable Leslie Lilly has served Virginia Beach for nearly 50 years as a budget officer, assistant to the city manager, assistant Commonwealth attorney, city attorney, and circuit court judge. And whereas Judge Lilly was appointed city attorney soon after the 1989 Greek Fest riots and deftly coordinated legal aspects of the city's public policy response and defense of legal claims that arose. Whereas he City Attorney's Office into five functional areas, enabling staff attorneys to develop specializations within their fields and strengthen their expertise so the city could address complex legal matters in-house, thereby saving taxpayers the expense of hiring outside counsel. And whereas, while City Attorney, he initiated legal research and led associated litigation that preserved public access to beaches along both the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean and work to establish the city's agriculture reserve program to preserve farmland and open space for future generations. And whereas, Judge Lilly played a key role in paving the way for numerous development projects, including the amphitheater, town center, the Virginia Beach Sportsplex, the convention center, and more. <clears throat> and whereas, he developed and helped execute a nationally acclaimed strategy to roll back encroachment around Naval Air Station Oceana to preserve 12,000 jobs by protecting the city's largest employer. And whereas, in the face of a major water crisis that threatened the prosperity and future growth of the city, Judge Lilly spearheaded the negotiations and defense of an eight-year plan to secure the Lake Gaston project to ensure a safe, reliable water supply for Virginia Beach for decades to come. And whereas, Judge Lilly continues to serve Virginia Beach by ensuring justice as a circuit court judge. And whereas Nostalgic VB is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in January 2023. Now, therefore, I, Robert M. Bobby Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, do hereby proclaim the Honorable Leslie L. Lilly, recipient of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award. In Virginia Beach, I call upon the citizens and members within government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools in Virginia Beach to be of service for the benefit and betterment of the community so that future generations can appreciate and further uplift our beloved city of Virginia Beach. In witness thereof, I have unto set by my hand caused the official seal of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia, to be affixed to this 20th day of September, 2022. Thank you, Judge. I'll bring this down to you. Plus a few comments, please. Sure. 
It was a good one. <laughs> well, Mr. Mayor um, and members of council, I, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm honored um, greatly to uh, receive this proclamation and all the nice things that are said. Um, there are just so many memories, so many days, and I, I've got to met, mention this one memory, and I'll be short. I'll watch the three minutes. I'll, I'll be very short. Uh, we're going to give you an ex exemption, Judge. <laughs> I, I, I can remember so many things. We could talk for hours, but I won't. Um, I can remember one of the first things as city attorney, Ms. Henley wanted an agricultural reserve program. And I can remember Ms. Henley, I believe Mr. Baum went, I'm not sure, but I know our beloved Bob Scott, our planning director went, and a fantastic land use attorney, and Bill McCauley and myself, we went to the Pine Barrens of New Jersey and looked at the uh, agriculture or the res land reserve program there. And that was one of the first things, Ms. Henley, that, uh, I, w that I participated in as city attorney. And I still remember that and remember your, your advocacy for that program. And everything that we did here in the city for these many years, and I've worked with so many councils, and Myra was, Myra Obendorf, whom you're going to honor later or immediately after me, I was the mayor the entire time that I was here, and the council and Ms. And Ms. Obendorf, Mayor Obendorf, gave us such vision and insight and policy direction. And then we had such a fantastic city team, from, from the city manager's office to the, count, to the uh, staff members, uh, planning department, uh, our public works department. Um, I, I've had the great pleasure of working with really all of the city managers of this city, except for Russell Hatchett, who predated, who, uh, predated me. But I started with Roger Scott. And so I've been in this municipal government a long time, and, and I feel like this is home. And, and the members of my office that worked with me these many years, Mark Stiles uh, was our lead litigator, and, and we had many other litigators, and our land use attorneys were led by Bill McCauley. Um, uh, the administrative office, we had a freedom of information office. We were the first in, sta in the state to initiate that. And Rod Ingram has been a foundation of that ever since. And you can't mention BRAC. And the, uh, one of the least known projects or celebrated project is achieving the public beach easements along the Atlantic Ocean and Chesapeake Bay. But they're so important to our city. And Becky Kubin, you can't mention it without mentioning Becky Kubin. And uh, we just have had such a fantastic uh, team of employees that worked for the councils uh, and city managers that were visionary. And it was a wonderful era, if you will, uh, that's been celebrated. And I appreciate so much having the opportunity to be part of it. Uh, God blesses us all in various ways. And I feel like I've been blessed to be here. So thank you. Uh, uh, Rosemary. I want to say something. Um, Les, we were... We were so lucky to have you for so many years, and then, you, of course, you went to the bench. Uh, you had your pulse and creative thinking on so many things. But you will remember this, but some of our new people, we had a slogan for less. With less, you get more. <laughs> and that's to this very day. With less, we always got more. Thank you for your dedication and contribution and love of the city. Thank you, Ms. Wills. Thank you. And Les, let me just say, uh, I think you highlighted it beautifully. Virginia Beach has a legacy of excellence in leadership and the people that live here. It's a remarkable city, and folks like you and a lot of the people that you named helped make it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think it's real great you guys went to New Jersey for inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like the New Jersey thing. I, I should also mention, and, and just to close very quickly, the BRAC process was just such an, uh, a project. We had seven months to, to, to do it. The ordinances, over 50, I think, Bill McCauley drafted. Becky Kubin was all over the real estate and continues to be in managing that program, so I understand. And uh, it, was, it was a great success for the city, and I, I am, am glad we could be a part of it. So no, thank thanks, you. Les. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you know, next, I have the honor of uh, addressing a remarkable woman, and uh, is Marcy Obendorf Kelso and Heidi Obendorf here? Yeah, come on up. How are you all doing? I'll tell you what, I am proud to acknowledge your mom, a legacy, a landmark that made an indelible imprint on the city of Virginia Beach. 
and I'm proud to read this. But, you know, as a point of personal privilege, when I, back in the days when I was a rookie councilman, your mom, Myra, actually performed my wedding ceremony under the cr uh, cross at First Landing Park with my beautiful wife, Trish. And it was, a, she was very much of my remarkable day. And it was just such a pleasure to serve with him, her. And uh, her legacy continues with you. Myra Fran Ellison Ovendorf has left an indelible mark on the city of Virginia Beach, paving the way for future female citizen leaders as the city's first female mayor, first Jewish mayor, longest serving mayor, and first popularly elected mayor. Whereas Mayor Arbendorf worked tirelessly for the betterment of the residents of Virginia Beach as a passionate public servant who championed the city's library system and volunteer program, promoted a family-friendly oceanfront, fought for a seawall and boardwalk for hurricane protection, negotiated with the 2005 Base Realignment and Closure Commission to save Oceana, and lead the city's bid to construct a Lake Gaston pipeline to ensure a reliable water source for Virginia Beach. And whereas Virginia Beach has benefited tremendously from the achievements during her two consecutive decades at the helm of, as, uh, of such of the opening of key landmarks and city, city facilities, including the Central uh, Library, now named after her, and the Congo, the Pungo Blackwater Library, the Virginia Beach Aquarium, the Virginia Beach Pavilion, and the Virginia Beach Convention Center, the Virginia Beach Amphitheater, and Bay Bayside and SeaTac and Princess Anne Recreation Centers, the Judicial Center, Sandler Center for the Performing Arts, and the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art. That's quite an impressive list. Whereas during Mayor Obendorf's tenure, she also ushered in the birth of Town Center and cut the ribbons dedicating the Tidewater Veterans Memorial, the original Kids Cove and Mount Trashmore Park, the 24th Street Park, and King Statue. Whereas she was a party in helping to establish the Human Rights Commission, Citizens Advisory Committee, American Music Festival, and more. Whereas Myra Obendorf also shared her talents beyond Virginia Beach's borders and held several national leadership positions in the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities. Whereas Nostalgic VB, is a celebration of Virginia Beach pioneers and res re re residents leading up to the 60th anniversary of our great city in uh, January of 2022. Therefore, I, Bobby Dyer, Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, do hereby proclaim Myra Fran Ellenson Obendorf, recipient of the Virginia Beach Diamond Award in Virginia Beach, and I call upon all the citizens and members within government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools in Virginia Beach uh, to be a, a service for the benefit and benefit, benefit of the community so the future generations can appreciate and further uplift and love our city of Virginia Beach. Thank you.
Thank you all. Um, it's amazing to see, I think five of you served with my mother. I was counting up here, which is fabulous that you're still serving. Um, and I have to share, since uh, Mayor Dyer is the second person who my mom married in the room, um, I didn't get married by my mother, but um, when my husband Marty and I were married 33 years ago, there was a photograph in the paper of the wedding um, with my mom front and center, and it said Mayor of the Bride. So I did, <laughs> <laughs> I did get that. Um, my parents, and of course, everybody also knows that when you honor Myra Oberndorf, you have to honor Roger Oberndorf. Um, they were here from the beginning of the history of Virginia Beach. In 1964, they um, bought a piece of land in on a, an old horse farm that was being created into Carol Ann Farms, and they built a house that they lived in for the rest of their lives. About two years later, I came along, and at about the same time, interestingly enough, my mother's career was a series of dares, essentially. Um, they needed somebody on the library board who wouldn't make waves, so they asked my mother to join the library board. She had this little baby. What, what was she going to do? She ended up um, on the cover of Ford Employee Magazine, Myra versus City Hall. She fought this huge battle to get the amazing library system that we have today. Um, then in 1974, interestingly enough, there was another article in the paper. I cannot remember who was quoted, but somebody was quoted saying, Myra Oberndorf will never run for city council. She was at that point the, the chairman of the library board. And so my father, Roger, the, the man behind the scenes said, well, this means you have to run for council. And so she did, and actually my sister Heidi had her uh, debut as a voiceover actor. She was on the commercial for that campaign saying, that's my mom in the background. Um, Myra lost that, collect, that campaign, but in 1976, she was elected the first mayor, the first Jewish person, I think, to any elected office in Virginia Beach. Um, and then she served until 08, which is amazing. And Heidi and I had the honor of getting to watch from behind the scenes. Um, um, I'm often asked why I've never run for office, and it's because I had the honor of watching from behind the scenes. So thank you all for the work you're doing, because we know very well how tough it is. And thank you very, very much for remembering Myra my, our mom, and of course, I've always got to put Roger into that sentence too. They, they go together. A Thank fond you. legacy, believe Thank me. You. Thank you. Barbara and then John. Hello, Marcy and Heidi. Hey. Uh, it's good to see you. I know we've had many opportunities to, uh, to be with you, and I just have to say that it was the inspiration of your mom that caused me to run in 1978, and uh, so I was the second woman to be elected to the council, and I'm still around. But I can tell you that Myra just dedicated her life to the city of Virginia Beach and gave everything. And there was no place that she wouldn't go if she was invited. She went everywhere. I was always amazed at her energy and her ability to get to 10 or 15 different places every day. Uh, she was just phenomenal, and she gave everything. And you're right, uh, Roger was right there every step of the way. And he we managed really... your first campaign, <laughs> didn't he? You, you got the Roger treatment, yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, we just appreciate you all uh, letting her or supporting her throughout all of this. And I know there was a lot to watch, and uh, Myra and I, all these, I keep still finding notes back and forth that we send each other. But we plan to write a, uh, our, our memoirs, so I'll have to do it for her as well. So anything you have, hang on to it. One of these days, we're going to tell the whole story. <laughs> Thank you. John? Your mom was very special. You know, I'm not going. John, is your mic on? You know, your mom was very special, you know. Like you, she got me into politics as well. But I remember being a high school kid working on those first two campaigns. And she used to tell that story. I won't repeat it here. But she sacrificed having a personal private life to serve the people of Virginia Beach. 
and not many people really know what that means. I know you know what that means, and I appreciate the sacrifices that you made to make her service to us possible, and she will always be in my heart. My wife, Kathy, we talk about her often at certain moments, and she is a lasting memory of what's the best about Virginia Beach is Myra. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. God bless you guys. Okay, now uh, we have a couple bids for, uh, you know, to read. And the first bid is for the communications tower lease agreement and pursuant to section code. 15.2-2102, I will now summarize the bids that have been received for the proposed long-term lease on city property containing 10,000 square feet together with an access and utility easement abutment thereunto located off Indian River Road in Virginia Beach. One bid has been received as follows. Crown Castle GT Company, LLC has bid a 10 term with option to renew up to two additional five year terms upon a, a mutual agreement of the city and Crown Castle for a maximum of 20 years. Are there any other persons desiring to submit a bid? There being no further bids, the bidding is closed. City staff has evaluated the bill received and recommend that Crown Castle be awarded a tower lease agreement. We will now open a public hearing for the proposed long-term lease on city property containing 10,000 square feet, together with the access utility easement, a, bru a bruant thereto located off to Indian River Road in Virginia Beach. Any speakers? We have two speakers. The first one is Barbara Messner, and after Ms. Messner is Sarah Gerloff. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I didn't say anything. I'll take one minute or a second to say something. Les Lilly, his parents met at 31st Street Park, and he was very helpful in giving citizens the, uh, the foyers without spending a penny. But anyway, I'll, I'll save that for another day. Okay, uh, lease for up to 20 years to a private corporation. And you didn't even mention uh, the lease amount. Some leases, like the 99-year lease um, at the Dairy Queen and the 99-year lease at Illegal Both at 31st Street. Um, you know, we're... We're paying private corporations to lease their land, and now you're leasing this land, um, and you're not telling us what the what the amount is. Uh, is it a dollar a year? Is it five hundred thousand a year to lease ten thousand square feet? That's pretty valuable property. Um, so. I'm opposed, and then I guess the next one will be separate, uh, non-exclusive franchise Loomis Telephone Com Telephone LLC. Um, there's construction all over the city. I'm going to open up. We don't have enough police, fire, rescue, and zoning is MIA. OSHA is MIA. EPA is MIA, and your eyes are not on anything except air wallets and entertainment venues. It's not your job to entertain. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Garloff. Good evening. Good evening. So let's remember, our laws are based on common sense. 
known as common law, also known as the law of the land, the laws of nature. Some of you seem to be under the false pretense that we are under maritime law. The, law belong, the land belongs to the people, and our elected representatives do not have the authority to lease, buy, or sell our land without our consent. This council is elected by the people to protect our unalienable rights and to represent the people equally. This council has been acting more like a corporate board representing select stakeholders instead of all the people. You run Virginia Beach like it's your company, Virginia Beach LLC. You and the stakeholders hiding behind the corporate veil never had the right to usurp our land. You do not own our land, but you do own Virginia Beach LLC and all the debt that goes along with it. It's your debt. You're in hot water because the people will not be bailing you out. Let's all remember, it's time to, for you to pay your debt because you have trespassed against many. I remember. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, thank you. And um, okay, we're gonna move on to the uh, next lease. Okay, and um, do we or uh, do we have or do we have the speakers on the next? Mayor, you need to read the, read the thing. The okay. bid opening for that one as well. Okay, uh, pursuant to um, you know, the code, uh, this is for the non-franchise agreement pursuant to a Virginia Beach City Call. I will now summarize the bids that have been received for the proposed non-exclusive franchise agreement for the purpose of constructing, installing, and maintaining the facilities for telecommunication services within the streets, uh, city streets and public right-of-ways. One bid, bid has been received as follows. Lumos Telephone LLC has a bid, bid for a 10 term with automatic renewal option for an additional 10 year, the maximum of 40 years. Are there any other persons desiring to submit a bid at this time? Okay, there being no bids, uh, the bidding is closed. City staff has evaluated the bids received and recommends that Loomis be awarded the non-exclusive franchise agreement. We will now conduct a public hearing for the purpose of non-exclusive franchise agreement for constructing, installing, and maintaining uh, facilities for telecommunications and within the city streets and public rights of ways. Any speakers? Yes, sir. We have two speakers. Catherine Mosley is the first speaker. And after Ms. Mosley is Barbara Messner. Welcome. Good evening, um, Mr. Mayor, Mrs. Vice Mayor, and City Council. Uh, we want to thank you and Virginia Beach staff for reviewing our franchise application. Lumos has a long history in Virginia and North Carolina. We began as telephone companies and are now focused on fiber broadband to the home and to small businesses. And we have an unheard of satisfaction rate of 90%. We respectfully want to serve Virginia Beach residents and small businesses that do not have access to fiber broadband at this time. As you all know, the pandemic showed us that connectivity is not a luxury, but a necessity. And fiber broadband is the latest and greatest technology. We are excited with your approval to build to 50,000 homes in Virginia Beach and to offer a new option for your residents. Again, we are grateful for your review, and I'm available to answer questions if you have any. Any questions? Okay, thanks a bunch. Thanks for coming. Next speaker is Barbara Messner. Good evening. Okay, it would be nice if we had an opportunity to review all these bids at least two weeks prior so we can be informed when we speak. 
Um, Non-exclusive franchise for another phone company. Um, right now, it's Cox and, and Verizon. Verizon is charging us. Ms. Henley, 2017, I brought it up that, you know, Cox, Cox Communications, you, the city of Virginia Beach is the franchise authority, if you look at your bill. And... When you charge them, you know, for their services, it's in the contract that they're, you're, they're allowed to pass on those fees and taxes to us if you look at your bills. So I don't know how any, like I said, it's been months since Verizon tore up Air Neighborhood, and they haven't, you know, they've been charging us for like a year, but they, there's no fiber optic, there's no Verizon. Um, and we have flooding and crumbling infrastructure. So it's, it's going to be kind of hard for somebody to uh, put anything in with the situation we have. Um, authorized city manager Duhaney, who goes on all these trips, including Spain, New York with Pharrell, but doesn't respond to the citizens or meet with the citizens, just the players. Ex have him execute a lease, but he works for you. It's your lease. You just hired him, 350000 plus, to enter into these leases on city-owned property. Um, that one's Crown Castle. And two, uh, grant a franchise agreement to Loomis Telephone Company to install, operate, and maintain network facilities for telecommunications services. So I don't think there's due process, and I think um, we have a right to have more information well in advance of a 359 that turned into, no, 300, yeah, 359 and then 360 pages. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, at this point, I'll read the speaker's policy. I, I want to remind everyone that the city council speaker policy that allows certain representatives of group to speak for 10 minutes applies only to planning items. All other speakers, whether speaking individually or on behalf of a group, will have up to three minutes to speak on a single item. Speakers, <coughs> excuse me, are reminded that the comments during the formal session of the meetings must be limited to the subject of the item that is being considered by the council at the time you are called. For items placed on the consent agenda, speaker will have up to three minutes to address any single item. If a speaker wishes to address multi uh, multiple consent ag agenda items, uh, the speaker will have a, a cumulative time of six minutes to address those items. Again, the speaker must limit his or her comments to the subject matter of the items that have been signed up to address. Finally, I call upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussions and decorum. Whatever views you hold and wish to express, the city council wants to hear from you and to ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected. The best way to do this is for all of uh, us to survive for civility and respect. Okay, uh, do we have uh, um, one item, uh, speakers? Uh, yes, Barbara Messner. Ms. Messner, you'll be speaking on everything except K-7. Okay, can you wait on sign up, please, please? K-7, K-15, and K-18. K-6. 
seven. Okay. Seven, fifteen, and eighteen. Okay, wait one sec. before I came here. Okay. But I didn't get a return call. K7, 15 and 18. I find the page, K7. Okay. That's it, K7? No, no ma'am. K7, K15, and K18. L2. Four okay, and five. It's on a different page. L two, four, and five. L two, four, and five. Thank you. Since I only have six minutes, I'm going to do some of them out of sequence. I fought the horrible dome deal, which takes up our parking lots. For for years, we fought against this. Ms. Messer, could you stick to the items? It is hand? it is one of the items. Is that okay? It is one of the items. I don't know if you read the agenda, but it is one of the items. If it's pulled, I'll uh, I'll uh, okay. And like I said on. All of these franchises stop corporate welfare, relocate the king of nepotism to the bottom of the sea, all your Neptune parades and parties and entertainment that costs money and it takes up their police time. It's we the people. And your documents, if anybody reads the agenda, no candidates here, you know. They're not signed, they're not notarized, your name's not on there. So most of these documents and ordinances are not legal and binding. I'm going to start with the one that I... The zoning ordinance, did all of you get the letter? It was to Henley, it was to all of you, um, on the lighting requirements. It's been over a year that I sent you Alex, uh, Alexandra, Virginia's um, ordinances and the National Lighting Ordinance. Um, and I mentioned that you didn't even include the, the problem with the lights on the cars, on the vehicles that are, uh, that are blinding and dangerous. Okay. Fall cleanup month, Miss Henley. It's past time to enforce litter laws. And the city litters as much as anyone in the city with all your events. I saw that the um, public workers had a protest. They still are, some of them are paid only $15 an hour. And it's a pretty dirty job. Okay. Um, so I oppose asking us to clean up the mess that other people make. How many times do you all go out there with a bag and clean up? Do you clean up after your dog? Uh, Miss. Okay. Ms. All right. No. It's fall cleanup time. I don't even go to the beach anymore because it's filthy. It's disgusting. Name a paved area at 31st Street Park for Nancy Creech, who does the nepotism festival? Uh, Performance Plaza? I mean, you're, you need to get out of the entertainment industry and funding just for the resort strip. There's an entire city out there. Okay. October Mel. Malnutrition Awareness Week. You starve the citizens to death, you push them out of their homes, and you talk about caring about human rights. Okay, amend the code, time for bidders. Okay. 
amend various federal grant programs by housing and neighborhood preservation. Andy Friedman, who retired, um, and Kevin Kemp, um, you know, you haven't uh, taken care of preserving the neighborhood. There's a lot of blight that y'all don't take care of, especially still haven't done anything about Oceana Crossings. You put your signs there, certain candidates, so you should go around and look at the dumpsters that are filthy and disgusting, and that seeps into the waterway. Okay. Replacing a pump station, that should have been done decades ago. Um, acquisition, fee simple, uh, or, and condemnation property. Okay. Stabli uh, I'll pass that one for, for a reason, but um, Cape Henry Lighthouse should be funded by the state, not the city. It's a really nice, nice place, and the the buses, you know, should take people there. Okay. I really think with uh, 34 items that six minutes, when you all take up 10 minutes each over and over and over, is outrageous. So... I'm opposed to the lack of due process. In the library books, we still have problems with CRT. I watch the informal. You've expanded government. You're into, it's air children. You're not foster Thank you care. very much. You're welcome very much. It was That's three, all the speakers, sir. It was sir. four seconds when you made that.
and utility easement, all located at the rear of 2789 Sandpiper Road regarding construct and maintain a walkway, wood deck, wood dock, excuse me, Kangway floating dock, and a bulkhead with two returns and maintain an existing in ground pool. Number 17 is the ordinance to authorize temporary encroachments into portions of city rights of way known as 20th Street, Baltic Avenue, and Arctic Avenue for the Atlantic Park Development Project regarding A, construct and maintain a concrete patio and landscaping retaining wall, concrete steps, and a concrete ramp along 20th Street, B, concrete steps, concrete landscape retaining wall, and patio and concrete steps along Baltic Avenue, and C, concrete a second story balcony along Arctic Avenue. Number 19, the ordinance to accept and appropriate 1.5 million of federal funds from the state of good repair primary extension program capital project 10401 regarding road paving projects. Number 20, ordinance to accept and appropriate 101 $181,300 from American Rescue Plan Act tourism recovery program grants in FY 2022-23 Convention and Visitors Bureau operating budget regarding support various convention events, events in the city. Number 21, ordinance to accept and appropriate $90,000 from American Rescue Plan Act Tourism Recovery Program grant to FY 2022-23 Convention and Visitors Bureau operating budget regarding sports marketing related to the Jackalope Festival. Number 22, ordinance to accept and appropriate an additional $69,061 from the Virginia Department of Fire Programs and Aid to Localities grant funding in the FY 2022-23 Fire Department operating budget regarding personnel, protective apparel, equipment, department training, and community outreach activities. And number 23, ordinance to accept and appropriate $59,000 from the Virginia Department of Emergency Management to FY 2022-23 Fire Department operating budget regard technical rescue and hazmat programs. Number 24 is the ordinance to accept and appropriate $1,136 from the Virginia Beach Library Foundation and the FY 2022-23 Public Library Operating Budget regarding reimbursement for furniture purchased for Bayside Area and Special Services Library. Number 25, ordinance to transfer $300,000 within the FY 22-23 Waste Management Fund Operating Budget from the capital outlay accounts to the operating accounts regarding continuing leasing waste collection trucks. Number 26, ordinance to transfer $217,354 from capital projects 10557 flood mitigation assistance grant number four to FY 2022-23 Office of Emergency Management operating budget regard cover increased construction costs, material costs and project administration. Open a public hearing on planning. <clears throat> and this number one, Frank A. Zingales and James T. Cromwell, Esquire receiver for Shore Realty Corporation, a defunct corporation for a street closure regarding portion of the unimproved lane adjacent to the rear of 276th Street District, number six. Number three, Ocean Condominium Developers, LLC, ORP Ventures, LSD for modification of conditions regarding two duplexes at 404 34th Street, District 6. And um, number six is request a deferral from Mike Daubert, Black Bay Farms Incorpor Incorporated for a conditional use permit regarding assembly use at 1833 <coughs> Princess Anne Road, District 2. And then number seven. America Real Estate Company, Thomas Brill, Irrevocable Trust, Howard E. Gordon, trustee for conditional use permit regarding a mini warehouse, truck, and trainer rentals at the southern corner of the intersection of Holland Road and Stoneshore Road, west of 3427 Holland Road, District 10. And then number eight, ordinance to add section 250, 251, 252, 253, and 254 to the city zoning ordinance, CZO, regarding lighting requirements, sponsored by Council Member Blue, uh, Henley. Okay, and any comment, any discussion? Barbara? Just a clarification, item six will be uh, deferred to October 18th. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, do we, motion, we have a motion to approve? Do we have a second? Second. All right, the vote is open. 
The vote is the vote is open. By vote of 10 to 0, you have approved the consent agenda as read by Vice Mayor Wilson, noting the deferral of item L6 until this, I mean, October 18th, 2022. Okay, great. Thank you. And going back to ordinances and resolution number seven, the ordinance to amend city codes 35 158 and 35 161 Ray tax on transients obtaining lodging. We have two speakers. The first speaker is Kendall Maynard. And after Ms. Maynard is Barbara Messner. Welcome. Hi. It's been a long time since I've been here. Nice to see you. I know. You just opened a couple of months ago. Man. It was all that short-term rental fun okay. stuff. Okay. <laughs> I'm Good your to uh, see you. Hi, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and the Council. I'm Kendall Maynard, legal short-term operator. Uh, 108 45th Street, as in this provision is accommodations provider, and I also use Airbnb as an accommodations intermediary on occasion, so you understand where I am. I come to you today to point out, and I could be totally wrong, maybe I've misread something. I agree with Maine Ordinance uh, as the General Assembly, but then I'm not sure in the notes if you're requiring a second report to the Planning Department. So. I, that's where I am. I don't understand why you need two reports. Um, I call it a swing and a miss. While I agree with the uh, rooting out the bad actors, because those of us who are legal don't want the bad actors either, the ones in, that are not in compliance is a priority to root them out. Also, it will give revenue to the city. It will also cut off that revenue when those bad actors are found and have not complied and asked to cease and desist operations. Wouldn't it be much better to have some revenue avenue for amnesty for those short-term rental operators that have been discovered, have not had, had any complaints, and bring them into compliance, then allow to continue for revenue into the city? I love the city, too. I want to see it grow. I oppose the requirement for the second reporting to planning. One, for the reason that an outside entity like an intermediary to require, be required to file two separate reports looks pretty bad in the optics for the city. You can't have planning talk to your revenue department or your revenue department's not talking to your planning department. I have a solution for that coming. Um, planning doesn't need another report. I filed and got my renewal last month. I got a... Um, Quote from Jessica today, she's one of your inspectors. She spoke to your zoning administrator, which I'm not sure who that is, that her take was it is a commissioner of revenue request and they are not do not anticipate an impact to zoning. This tells me that they are not going to be collating and rooting out the bad actors with some ginormous report from those intermediaries. Filled with all the addresses of not just the SDRs, but I don't know if you realize those reports are gonna encompass all your home sharers that will most likely not be separated out in your reports from Airbnb. So you're gonna have a big report with all of it. So I don't know how you're gonna end up separating that out. It duplicates work on, and in this digital age, your commissioner of revenue should be able to talk to your planning department. Additionally, planning couldn't even answer my emails for three days or my phone calls or my voicemails when I put in my renewal for request. I'm hoping that has been corrected now. Thank you very much. Appreciate oh, I'm it. sorry. I didn't realize I thought I had three minutes. You did. Oh, okay. I had a great solution. I'm sorry, Mayor. I meant to say the solution would be have planning report to the Commissioner okay. of Revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Your time's up. Uh, any questions or concerns for the. Uh... Yep. Rosemary? Mark, you want to explain this? I could be, yeah. This just simply allows communication okay. between yeah, the... Yeah, Mr. Dehaney, hang on. Um, Mayor, we just letting we, you know we have we another speaker. Like to, we were just going to let you know we have another speaker, too. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Mark. Mr. Harmeyer apparently would uh, <laughs> oh. like to address that okay. question. I had a great solution. I'm sorry. As noted in the agenda request, the council had in its legislative agenda last year 
a provision that would have allowed the Commission of Revenue to share information with planning provided it was specific to short-term rentals. That didn't get passed, but a different version of legislation, which was in your package, got passed, which basically said the accommodations intermediaries shall report to the localities. And so it wasn't specific on, on what that reporting will be. And so as presented to you, the gross receipts and the addresses get reported to the Commissioner of Revenue for his revenue purposes, and just the address gets reported to planning. The, the sharing of information between the Commissioner and planning is, has never been um, a, a a piece of this that's been well understood. But as the taxing authority, he's under a threat of misdemeanor for sharing certain information, including gross receipts information with planning. And so um, that keeps him from sharing information in a way that, that I think we could all agree would be both practical and efficient. It's just he's the taxing authority and he has that sort of uh, threat over him on this type of information. So there would be two reports, but th there actually is a reason for it. Hey, anyone else? Guy? Would it be fair, Mr. Harmari, to say that, that we have made the best of the situation that the General Assembly has left us in trying to make sure that our both our Commissioner of Revenue and our Planning Department has the information they need to properly enforce the law? That is true. Um, I still stand by the, the piece that was in the legislative agenda last year that okay. would allow direct sharing, but we are where we are. Under the circumstances. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? And the next speaker. speaker is Barbara Messner. You can't have different rules for different speakers. You can't answer some and not others. And for the record, I think I attended almost every um, every meeting on short-term rentals, including the one that went to 1.30 in the morning. And you were given a lot of input from the citizens, which you chose not to do because all you care about is profit. Um, you're turning almost every condo, almost every adult, every piece of property into Airbnb short-term rentals, it's impossible for anyone to have uh, an affordable residence. And it's not your job to give affordable uh, housing to certain employees and certain workers. It's supposed to be free enterprise. Um, when we had the six-month rentals, you know, Atkinson started all this, uh, Six months uh, was fine, it was bearable. But to have different people coming and going in almost every neighborhood uh, with the rules, plus um, one of your city managers, um, Matthias, I call him Methuselah, that's why it helped me remember Matthias. You know, he was your paid lobbyist to put through these things. And now you have one that works 24 seven, you're paying another lobbyist. So when you put all these things to the General Assembly, then you have a lobbyist working for you up there and you help elect certain people. Um, you know, I'm opposed to event houses, you destroyed Sandbridge, you've destroyed, you know, most neighborhoods. Um, and the taxes that you take, they don't lower air taxes. Um, it, all, it all stays in certain districts, mostly the resort district. So whenever we have crime in the rest of the city and all the police, fire, and rescue are babysitting alcohol parties and everything else, you shouldn't be in the alcohol business on your public beaches. And... Uh, our sheriffs and our police and EMS shouldn't be on call all the time for these events. We need a normal city. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, uh, do we have a motion? I'd like to move for approval. Second. All right, any other discussion? The vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you approve the, 
the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 15, resolution to declare 2016-2020-2020-36 Princess Anne Road to be a revitalization area Ray qualifying for Virginia House Housing Financing. We have three speakers signed up. Um, two are via WebEx. Barbara Bassner is the first. Okay, which item? 15. Declare 2016 20, 2020 2036 Princess Anne Road to be revitalization area. I hope somebody will watch the informal. I have never seen y'all working on so many things. We don't need expanded government. You don't take care of what you have, and you do a horrible, rotten job. Um, a revitalization qualify for housing financing, HUD, the ABC store, mixed use, Summer House by 31st Street. All mixed use are HUD subsidized. Um, yeah, and I said 359, it was 559, which changed to 560 pages for the agenda. There were 26 items just for ordinances. So anybody who's running for office doesn't deserve a vote from anybody if they can't read the agenda and show up. And the ones who are incumbents who use photos of themselves from 1990 and, you know, they can't, None of y'all can reply to my emails or phone calls. I'm informed and I have a right to a reply. So, yeah, I, I'm opposed. We don't have enough police, fire, and rescue, and you don't need to build anything else. We have flooding, crumbling infrastructure, and, um, and pollution. Our waters are polluted. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is via WebEx. So the next two, Tanya Milling, you are unmuted and may begin. Hello. Hi, my name is Tanya Milling, Executive Director of the ARC of Virginia, the only statewide advocacy organization made up of and led by people with developmental disabilities and their families. I'm speaking today in opposition to K-15 because it is our understanding that this designation as a revitalization area is a step in the process for a project known as Vanguard Landing that aims to build a housing project for up to 185 people with developmental disabilities. Um, at over 70 years old, the ARC is the oldest and largest community-based organization advocating for and with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we know that all people, regardless of disability, disability, excuse me, deserve the opportunity for a full life in their community where they can live, learn, work, and play. We know that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, like all Americans, have the right to live in their own homes in the community. The ARC believes that to ensure those rights are upheld, housing for people with disabilities should be scattered within typical neighborhoods and communities and should reflect the natural proportion of people with disabilities in the general population in order to avoid unnecessary segregation and isolation of people with disabilities. The impetus, we believe, excuse me, I apologize for that. Um, we believe that 
planned communities that target a specific population of people with disabilities is in direct opposition to the journey that Virginia has been on for the last decade to move away from segregated living to community-based services. And the impetus for this movement began following an investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice that found the Commonwealth in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act due to a failure to provide services to individuals in the most integrated setting appropriate to their needs. Virginia remains under that settlement agreement today as the Commonwealth continues to build a robust community-based system. And Virginia will remain under court monitoring until it gains compliance with the goals of integration, self-determination, and high-quality services. Finally, the argument that planned or intentional communities are a choice that people should have available to them overlooks the impact that this has on available public services and on public views of people with disabilities. Planned communities perpetuate the harmful belief that people with developmental disabilities cannot live their lives fully included in the community with the right support tailored to their needs. And it sets up a false premise that receiving services based on your individual needs equals an inability to be independent and integrated into the larger community. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next seat speaker also is by WebEx. Terry Morgan, you are unmuted and may begin. Good evening, members of the Virginia Beach City Council. My name is Terry Morgan, and I'm the executive director of the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities. I appreciate the opportunity to comment this evening. My comment is not specifically to oppose the resolution declaring the properties on Princess Anne Road, a revitalization area, but to express continued concern regarding the proposed 185-bed residential and day services development for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities that this action could further. As the Commonwealth works to improve integrated community-based options for people with disabilities, decisions about development, funding, and zoning must reinforce the Commonwealth's commitment to true integration and inclusion. According to the Vanguard Landing website, 185 people with disabilities will live, work, and recreate within its confines. At a time when the Commonwealth has closed all but one of the state-operated training centers, which were found by the Department of Justice to violate the Americans with Disabilities Act, this type of development is concerning and raises many red flags. However well-intentioned, disability-specific campus settings, like the one proposed by Vanguard Landing, are next-generation models of segregated services. As I mentioned, there are a number of red flags that are indicators of segregation, such as a 185-bed campus where people living there will be primarily people with disabilities. The people who live at Vanguard Landing will receive multiple services, including residential, day services, and social and recreational activities within the campus. People with disabilities will, by default, be isolated from the broader community. Vanguard Landing promotes Medicaid waivers as a source of funding for potential residents. Medicaid waiver funding is reserved only for settings where the individual has the same access to work, shop, socialize, and volunteer and receive services in the broader community as people without disabilities. Having all of these opportunities occur within Vanguard, the Vanguard Landing community itself is not community integration and does not represent access to the greater community to the same degree as people without disabilities. This is concerning and the ability to receive waiver funding is questionable. Vanguard Landing's website references what it calls reverse integration. Reverse integration recur occurs when a facility or intentional community serving individuals with disabilities invites the general public to join or engage in the activities offered within the community. While opening the doors to others without disabilities is positive, it is not in and of itself integration according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Increased segregation of people with disabilities is contrary to the progress made by both the Commonwealth and the nation. It is not consistent with the community integration mandate of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision, and Virginia's settlement agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice. And the purpose for this revitalization area is Thank you very specifically much. to expand. Appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, we, we, I do have Mr. Burdon signed up for... 
um, questions only. I'm not sure if you wanted, if you have questions this for him or, or Mr. Bernard, did you want yeah, to make comments? Um, you want to do the presentation first? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Bullertree. Mr. Mayor, I don't have any specific questions for Mr. Burdon. I appreciate that he's available. I don't know if any other council members do, but I did ask the staff to prepare a presentation about the this designation of a revitalization area, what it means. We'll have a chance to discuss some of the elements of the conversation that were raised by the speakers, but um, I would welcome and appreciate the opportunity to have this staff presentation to learn more about the revitalization area designation what that would mean for our Virginia Beach community. Would, would it be um, advisable to have Mr. Bardano speak after the presentation? I have no objection to that. If Does anybody to... object to that? Eddie, how about we have the presentation, then we'll definitely honor your request. Okay, Bobby? Leave Kathy Warren. Yeah, okay. Uh, with that kind of like development, we'll be presenting. I can just yes. present the information if that's all right with you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, good evening. Vice Mayor, members of council. We were asked to provide some additional information regarding revitalization areas uh, and specifically how it relates to Virginia housing financing programs and Vanguard landings requests this evening. So there are, oh, it's up. Yeah, you can see the disclosures. The organization, of course, is Vanguard Landing. The applicant is Deborah Deer, and I won't read the rest of those, but uh, I'll give you a, a few seconds to look at those. Uh, the next slide just shows a map of the area. Up in the left-hand corner is the municipal center. The red boundary is the site uh, located off of Princess Anne Road. So Virginia housing. This is formerly Virginia Housing Development Authority, or VHDA, provides lower cost financing for housing developments that provide affordable and mixed income housing that serves various populations within, within the same development. City Council is being asked to adopt a resolution tonight declaring the proposed Vanguard Landing site as a revitalization area in order to qualify for Virginia housing financing. This area may be designated as a revitalization area pursuant to the Code of Virginia if it meets the following. The industrial, commercial, or other economic development of the area will benefit the city, but the area lacks the housing needed to induce manufacturing, industrial, commercial, governmental, educational, entertainment, community development, healthcare, or nonprofit enterprises or undertakings to locate or remain in the area. And private enterprises and investment are not reasonably expected without assistance to produce the construction or rehabilitation of decent, safe, and sanitary housing and supporting facilities that will meet the needs of low and moderate income persons and families in the area and will induce other persons and families to live within the area and thereby create a desirable economic mix of residents in that area. So finally, for Virginia Housing to approve and close on Vanguard Landing's financing for the project, it must have the following. It must be designated as a revitalization area from the locality. It must have site plan approval and must have building permit approval. So the next side, slide just includes a, uh, the re most recent site plan submittal, their fourth submittal dated September of 22. Uh, our understanding is that is un under review and close uh, with the planning department for approval. And I believe that's the last slide, and we can take any questions or turn it over to Mr. Bernard. Any questions for yes. the speaker right now? Ms. Miles. Yes. How, how would you address the concerns of the, of the two WebEx speakers, their concerns about the concentration of, of those with um, 
disabilities? Because I, it seems like it's the same concept of concentrating poverty or low income into one area as well. How would you address that? Mr. Verdon probably is better yeah. suited to okay. address that than Eddie at this point. You're on. Okay. Sorry, I have a question. Though. Yeah, John, go ahead. You mentioned that one of the requirements is both to have a site approval and a building permit issued. And then you said there wasn't a site approval, yeah. which means there's no building permit because there's no site approval. So how do we vote on an item if it doesn't meet the two two of the three conditions you mentioned? You need all three. This is one of the three, and they can obtain the other two before they are able to close. Okay, well, see, that's an important statement to make because of, when you're reading the presentation, you would draw the conclusion that all three of those elements had a pre existing our vote, and you're saying that's not the case. No, in order for them to be approved by Virginia Housing and close on the financing, they need those three things. Tonight is just about the revitalization area. I just want to make sure I understood what came from that slide. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I have a question for Ms. Warren. And I realize that I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, could you describe maybe some of the other revitalization area designations? It's been represented to me that this is a standard practice, a standard designation. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could describe maybe a, just a few, cut one or two or three other examples where the city council has taken this action and we can either be aware of the circumstances or, or if I have any follow-up questions, I'd like the chance to ask them. Sure, so I am aware there's a list of others that uh, the city has designated revitalization areas for this purpose. Uh, one in particular that I was involved with was, at that time it was known as Price Street Apartments and it's over in the Witch Duck area. That was an area that was considered difficult to develop and it is a, it was under Virginia Housing Development Authority financing their low-income housing tax credit project. And so in order to get additional points as part of that application process, if you have that area designated as a revitalization area, it gets you closer to being able to obtain competitive financing. This is a little bit of a different program, but it's still needs that designation in order to qualify for financing under Virginia Housing. Would it be safe to say that, because when I think of revitalization, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not gonna you know, represent that I'm making lawyerly analysis here, which I realize is required, but also we need to use some common sense analysis too. So revitalization area is, um, to me, to the common person means you're improving upon something from where it already was. Are, or is it safe to say most of the other revitalization area designations were in areas where we were making improvements on existing um, parcels? Has it ever been designated for something that the sort of was no, there was nothing there in a rural or suburban part of the city? I am Does not that aware. Matter? I, Mark, I'd defer to you on on the definition there. Mr. Berlucci, I can't tell you that there are any that are exactly like the proposal before you. I can tell you that since 2000, Council has done this about eight times. Um, uh, you've done it for Tranquility at the Lakes, which was the um, um, apartments set uh, um, on Burton Station. You've done it for the Judeo Outreach Center uh, at, you know, down at the ocean front. You did it for uh, 27th Street, um, in addition to the Price Street apartment. So you've you've used this methodology in various different situations. I can't say that there's any that's exactly like this one, but you have used it in the past. And the determinations that you're making are the <clears throat> determinations that are set forth in lines 17 through 28 of the resolution. So. And, and the state law doesn't provide any specific metrics by which the council is to determine whether those things are made. If you conclude that this area of the city could benefit from economic development and you conclude that um, this, uh, this support is necessary to um, uh, produce additional housing types in the area and that they wouldn't occur but for that, then you can you can 
the council can choose uh, lawfully to make this designation. Thank you. Hey, John. It seems to me like what we have before us today. Councilmember Moss, could you turn your microphone on, please? What Thank we have you. before us today is a land use question of whether we want, from a land use perspective, to put this designation on the property. Whether or not they can make a compelling case to HUD that they can generate the income without maybe being eligible for Medicaid or Medicare for any of their clients on their property is an issue for the people willing to loan them the money <laughs> and the ability to think that they can pay it back. So that's a financing question. But I think we are just here today making a land use decision. Am I incorrect on what we're being asked to do? Yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. And, and Mr. Mayor, I have a follow-up yep. to that, which is that um, there is one difference. This, and, and, and I think my colleague is correct when you talk about this is a land use question. But we, we need to be mindful and well aware and eyes wide open about the precedent that we're setting because all the properties that you described are in more dense, more urban-like settings, not in more rural-like settings. So as we make land use decisions, I think it's incumbent upon us to be thoughtful and mindful about the differences in those decisions and what precedent that may set and what the implications of that could be. We'll have more time to have more robust discussions about some of the concerns that were raised by the speakers and, and some other things, but I at least want to make sure that that point is made for the record. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Berdon. Mayor, I don't want to extend um, your meeting. Um, I do have some remarks that somebody wants me to address the person who spoke on behalf of ARC. Um, if, that's, if that really isn't what's before you tonight, um, but I will say that this community will, will and I, that's in, in those remarks, if you want to hear them um, about um, Medicaid, Medicare, payments to, to people who um, will live here. It, that information, it's, it, they're, they're, they're a advocacy group for their point of view, but the, their, what they're stating is not, um, is not accurate, or, although tonight it was a little bit closer to being accurate than what we've heard at the Economic Development Authority uh, from their representatives on Zoom calls. Um, I will, but the one thing I want to mention is 27 on Atlantic, um, was a, a high-rise apartment building that has um, a workforce housing component. That property was totally clear um, when that resolution, same resolution, was approved by this council. Um, and also, the um, there's another apartment complex on 17th Street that um, hasn't gone up yet that that was voted on um, that the property also had no, nothing on at the time. Just, you know, FYI. This property is, it's in the transition area. Um, the city council uh, and city administration have been involved with this since the beginning, 2014, uh, with acquisition and approving the, uh, the use permit for this um, uh, housing component that is desperately needed in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And this is not an institution, people and their uh, the, um, intellectually and developmentally disabled uh, who will live here, they can live here, they can have family members live here, other people can live here um, as well, but it will be primarily citizens with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I can get into the federal regs and talk about that if you all want to hear it, but I don't want to belabor the point. Um, this is a resolution that is a requirement for the how, uh, Virginia housing uh, <laughs> financing, and, and that is a that they get that financing is a requirement of their agreements with the city and with the development authority, development department. Okay, any questions? Michael. Thank you, Mr. Berdon. You just represented to us that people who do not have intellectual and development disabilities can live there. Correct, but this will not be, as ARC proposes, that the, develop, the intellectual, intellectual disabled folks should be in every development to the percentage that they are in the population, um, essentially what, what they, they've argued. But what percentage would they be 
in this proposal? I'm sorry? What percentage would they exist in this proposal? We don't have, there's, we haven't, there's no set requirements as to how many. And, and it'll be developed in, in phases, just so that's clear. It's not going to all, we're not going to build all um, 39 residential buildings for 180 um, residents, you know, right off the bat. And the other four uh, buildings where there is you know, food service and, and other amenities that go with the, uh, uh, the rent. So if I could ask you, and I, I do have a few questions, so thank you for being cool. here and thank you for bearing with me. Still planned for a 185-bed campus, correct? Uh, I believe it's actually 180. 180. It may be, they, there may be something on their website that says 180. So of that 180, is that 180 persons with intellectual and development disabilities? No, it's, no, it's, or is that inclusive of all, all the people who would live there? All. So do you have, can you represent, and, and I realize we're, you know, I wasn't planning to have this conversation today necessarily either, but we're having it. So what percentage, even an estimation of what percentage I, I don't of have the a ratio percentage. would exist? I don't know how to have a, I did not come here, Mr. Belushi, to engage in a detailed discussion of the uh, the development and how many people there won't be dis with dis disabilities. We have parents who's, we got a, a whole bunch of them, they're, they're, trying, they're getting ready to buy houses here to move here. Um, and some of them or their siblings may reside here as well. It is, it is not a segregated community. We made that point to the development authority previously. Well, you may not have come here to have that conversation, but that's the conversation we're having today because from time and time again, the message that I receive is we can't ask those questions, but we have to ask those questions. You just heard from two organizations, the ARC of Virginia, the leading statewide advocacy organization for and with persons with disabilities, and from the executive director of the Virginia Board for Persons with Disabilities raising meritorious concerns about this proposal. So when can we have that conversation as a community? All right. Mr. Mayor, if I could, in order to answer this question, I'm going to read some of the remarks that I had prepared to discuss um, <clears throat> so that everyone understands where this is coming from. ARC is a special interest group, and it asserts that the federal settings rule, 42 CFR section 441.301 C1 through C4, would preclude Medicare and Medicaid assistance to individuals in this or other, any other, in their view, intentional community. However, sec subsection C4, which defines a home and community-based setting, also focuses on individual choice and individual control. The setting is selected by the individual from among settings options and optimizes individual initiative, facilitates individual choice regarding services and support, choice, choice of roommates, control of schedules, and choice of visitors. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services issued guidance in March of 2019, which makes it abundantly clear that its settings rule does not, does not, prohibit campus settings, farmsteads, and other intentional communities. That was reaffirmed in a letter to a congressional committee in 2021 in which the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services stated, the home and community-based settings rule does not prohibit, does not prohibit home and community-based funding for farmsteads, intentional communities, and campus settings. In its letter, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services went on to state that in determining a setting's compliance with the regulatory criteria, the focus should be on the experience of the individuals in the setting and not the setting's size, type, or location. Alternative settings, and this, there's a national advocacy group called Together for Choice, um, and their position and it's one that, that they advocate very strongly at the national level. Alternative settings such as intentional communities offer environments that are more suitable for certain individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, particularly those with significant behavioral challenges such as men and women with severe autism. 
many of which cannot live in small group homes in heavily populated areas. These individuals are better able to manage in the calm communal environments offered by farmsteads, intentional communities, and campus settings. Individual freedom and individual choice by family members. The senior com community in our city and in our country um, have free choice to live, whether it's in a area that is predominantly um, over 55 or over 62, and no governmental agency or <coughs> governmental body tries to restrict that in any way. Same is true for <coughs> religious and ethnic groups who decide that they would prefer individuals who prefer to live in an area that is populated primarily by those of their religious uh, persuasion or ethnic group. And again, no governmental entity, agency, et cetera, tries to restrict them in doing so. The idea that uh, ARC suggests that the government should restrict individuals who are with disability from having choices as where they can live, want to live, and how they live, to only being able to live in group homes in areas where their population matches the population at large of people with disabilities is, I would say, rather um, outdated. And so there is an advocacy here, and it's, you know, Virginia is the, in the bottom 10 in the country. They're number nine at the bottom uh, in terms of providing um, options for folks with disabilities, places for them to live. And people in this position and their families need choices, and this is what this represents. This area, Hampton Roads, is drastically underserved, just as this, the Commonwealth is. This is not a institution. This is not a spot where people are going to be boarded in. They can come and they can go. They can work in the community. They can work up at, um, <clears throat> at Red Mill Commons or anywhere else that they you know, might get a job. And so the, the aspersions that have been cast are very unfortunate, very unfortunate. The city's made this commitment to, to this group. They've raised millions of dollars. They have abided by all of the requirements that they've been um, saddled with, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay, anybody else? I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, yes, please. Uh, I um, was very uh, pleased to, to be able in 2014 to vote in favor of this conditional use permit. Uh, I've supported it ever since. I continue to support it. I am delighted that they have the uh, housing, uh, Virginia Housing Development Authority uh, willing to uh, close on their loan with these last final things that they need from the city. And this being one of them, I move approval of this resolution. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I do have some discussion. And this is a topic, if you can't tell, that weighs very heavy on my heart and on my conscience. So I'm gonna take my time, I'm gonna make sure I get this right, to do my best to get it right. Because in my mind, this is a serious life and death, quality of life issue for families in Virginia Beach, for families in Hampton Roads, for adults with intellectual and, and developmental disabilities. It's a life and death issue. It's a best practice issue. It's a what is the future of our Virginia Beach going to look like for what posture we take toward compassionate policies that serve all people. And I don't question the motives or the character of the folks from who are proposing this. I'm using this opportunity, which is rare, in, in council to have a discussion. It's been represented to us that this is a standard designation, but it's not a standard designation because this is an uncommon presentation and proposal and project in our Commonwealth and in our city. You heard Mr. Berdan tell us that in Virginia, we're ranked among the lowest in terms of service and housing for people with disabilities. And we all want to see that ranking improve. We have to make sure that we do it correctly. We have to make sure that we do it right. I wasn't here however many years ago it was. I don't know exactly. Um, 
when the council approved Vanguard Landing. But if I had been here, I would have listened to the experts in the field, some of which we heard tonight, and tried to make sure that we had these questions answered. And that's all I'm asking for here tonight. That's all I'm asking for is an opportunity to have a robust discussion in our community about what's the best path forward to serve people with intellectual disabilities and their families. It's a difficult topic. But what you heard tonight was testimony from, these are not people off the street. These are not armchair experts. It's been represented to their advocacy organizations. I think the Virginia Board for Persons with Disability is a reputable organization. And I know that the Arc of Virginia is a reputable organization. So I take exception to the um, characterization that was presented for us earlier. But why is this important? It's important because, as you noted, in 2012, the Virginia, Virginia and the Department of Justice reached a settlement agreement. The agreement resolved a Department of Justice investigation of Virginia's training centers and community programs and the Commonwealth's compliance with the Americans with Disability Act and Olmstead decision with respect to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And as you heard from, I believe, Ms. Morgan, we're still under guidance and review from the Department of Justice about how we proceed. So it's very relevant. Every decision we make along this path is extremely relevant and important. And what, does the, what is the Olmstead decision? In 1999, the US Supreme Court held in Olmstead that unjustified segregation of persons with disabilities constitutes discrimination in violation of Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The court held that public entities must provide community-based services to persons with disabilities when such services are appropriate, the affected persons do not oppose community-based treatment, and community-based services can reasonably be accommodated, taking into account the resources available to the public entity and the needs of others who are receiving disability services from this entity. And what is community integration? And why does it matter? And this is from a foundation called the United Disability Services Foundation, which I think summarizes it very accurately. It helps them build practical life skills that lead to enhanced independence provides a path to recovery for those who feel isolated, gives them access to activities and services not available in segregated environments, offers the chance to engage with others and the satisfaction of being part of a diverse community, provides opportunity to learn appropriate social behaviors and make new connections, gives access to inclusive workplaces where they're treated the same as their peers who do not have disabilities. And what's the benefit for our larger community? more diverse relationships with those who have different viewpoints and experiences, more funding for the public when people with disabilities work and pay taxes, decreased costs associated with supporting people with disabilities, and most importantly, I think, the chance for all of us to experience the many gifts and talents of everyone in our community, every walk of life. So I could go on and on and read this information, and maybe this is not the appropriate setting, but where is the appropriate setting? And so that's what I want to ask the members of this body and the community. What we had previously was a non-competitive public loan to a nonprofit to establish this organization that experts in the field, objectively experts in the field, have raised questions about. So when can we have those questions answered? To the members of this body, I want to share with you, I'm going to submit for the record, a letter that was submitted to each of us on May 19th, 2022, by the Ark of Virginia, that enumerates their concerns. 
And I also have, and, and you heard from Ms. Morgan from the um, Virginia Board for People with Disabilities, I have written testimony that she provided to the Development Authority on June 15th, 21, raising similar concerns. You heard from her. I won't, I could go through and read these. I, I won't do that. I know we need to move on. But we can, as a body, cannot continue to ignore without response the meritorious concerns that have been raised by dis advocates for and with people with disabilities. I didn't join this council. You know, many of you know I served as president of Hampton Roads Pride. And in my work, my professional work, I have determined the necessity to be an advocate for inclusive policies, for policies that are compassionate. And as, as such, I feel a responsibility to advocate for the most inclusive policies possible. And that's the basis for my comments tonight. And it's been, I've been consistent about raising these concerns. But my question for this body and for this community is, when can we have these questions answered? And I appreciate Mr. Berdan's very detailed response. But we need to have a community conversation. We didn't have it before. And as we continue to be asked for public participation, I, have, I feel, I can only speak for myself, a sense of responsibility to elevate the concerns that are raised to this council, to this body, and to this city by leading experts in the field. And that's what I'm trying to do here today. So I, I would be interested if anyone else has any thoughts about best path forward here. I realize this is a technical designation, and I'm inclined to be supportive of this particular item, but I still have grave concerns that we continue to receive information from the experts in this field that go unanswered. And what does that say about our city? What does that say about the policies that we create here? So I thank you for your time. I thank you for your indulgence in my remarks. And um, I look forward to continued dialogue. OK, uh, you know, before we come you know, to the vote, I just want to say, Mr. Bellucci, I applaud you for your passion and understanding and you know the need for dialogue is certainly paramount i believe among all of us um kind of being the resident healthcare expert here there's one thing you can say about experts especially in controversial projects you can find experts on both sides of the question and then you get bogged down and I think what we have here is an application that, you know, we're under a little bit of a time constraint on it. But the, uh, the, the thing is, though, these are, as you know, Michael put out, very emotional arguments. And very similar to arguments that we hear about, you know, opening up homes, you know, to people and disabled in the neighborhoods, you know, where there's always been some controversy uh, about you know why are we, you know why here? Um, I think one of the about the thing is that no, nothing like this will ever be perfect. But is it necessary? Is there a need? Uh, uh, you know, but once again, I think a city defines itself by how it takes care of the people that are in need. And I think given the location and proximity and, you know, number of the other factors. And, you know, I, you know I, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to discuss it. Uh, this has been a long road, and I think it's a project wor worthy of our consideration. Uh, at this point, the vote's open. No, Mr. Moss. I don't disagree that there's a public policy debate. But we often talk about school choice and how important it is about choice. And no one's denying the other choices. So I think where this debate is going to get resolved is in the marketplace. Uh, people are going to go where their money will allow them to go. And unfortunately, in a capitalistic society, the more money you have, the more choices you have. 
and that's not an inexpensive choice for people to make, from my understanding. Uh, but I don't think any of us are an expert about what's best for someone else's child. That's been the whole issue with school choice. And so now here we're talking about a different type of choice. And so I think these are always the hardest issues in a constitutional republic, which talks about individual liberty is paramount, is do you have a compelling enough case to deny someone choice unless you can choose that the guardian making that choice is doing it to the disadvantage and to the injury of the person. So I, I'm, I'm, Michael, you know we've talked about this. I think you are right, but I just think this isn't the body that can adjudicate it because we don't set the rules, we don't set the standards for all those adjudications, and we don't have the expertise to adjudicate between experts. And so when experts differ, you know, my philosophy is, you know, somewhat of a libertarian, is let individuals choose and, uh, and, and time will prove whether or not that was a bad choice. No one wants to go back to the days of institutionalization, but that wasn't a choice of people. That was a choice that the state imposed on people to how to deal with it. So I think we've moved away from that. And, and I think, uh, while this might not turn out like we like, I do think it emboldens people for choice. And lack of a compelling argument, I think the marketplace has to resolve it. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, the vote's open. Council Member Wilson and uh, Wooten, may I have your vote, please? I did it several times. Thank you. By a vote of eight to two, you have passed the resolution. Why does it say 10? That's not right. Okay, thank you all for a very robust uh, conversation. You? Uh, moving on uh, to number 18, ordinance to carry forward and appropriate. Can I ask a question? Yes. Mr. Berlucci, did you? Could did you? See, could, could it be possible to display the last vote? It, gets two, it says 10 to 0. Mr. Berlucci, did, did you vote nay? Well, I can't open it again. I'm just asking. I did not. Okay. I'm sorry. You voted yes. You, okay. Thank you. So. I apologize, by vote of 10 to 0, pass the resolution. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes. And I apologize for belaboring. Would it be appropriate? I'd like to say one other thing about this topic. Yeah, could you make it succinct? I will make it succinct. I voted yes because this is a technical designation. And I, and I was persuaded by Mr. Moss's comments. But for me, and I'm only speaking for myself, future council action for me on this topic is going to have to require resolution of the topics that were raised about ADA and about Olmstead. It's vital that we have a community conversation about that, and I can no longer indulge technical designations without that being fully, comprehensively, and cohesively addressed. And I want to make sure that I'm clear and on record that that is my position. Thank, Thank you. you. May I just? Okay, Barbara. I believe there are legal responses to all of that. I think the state has addressed it. I think uh, Senator DeSteff did quite a uh, a bit in the state to overcome some of those things, and I'll be glad to prepare a response. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, uh, moving forward to number 18, ordinance to carry forward and appropriate $7,194,674 to the fiscal year 2020-2023 operating budget rate purposes previously approved in fiscal year 2021 and 22 to appropriate unused debt service to offset the use of public facility revenue bonds. We have one speaker, Barbara Messner. You know, I was there, uh, Mr. Bellucci, June 15th, and you were on council then, and they were in trouble for the missing 500,000. So you were here when Vanguard Landing, I was there at 8.30 in the morning at town center. So you should be informed. And these votes, you, you should have voted no, you should have asked for a deferral. Oh, you please get the topic, okay. we're on another We're item. talking about finance, and since you discriminate and let some people have a dialogue and not others, I'm using my uh, 
constitutional right to my three minutes. You, uh, we have a speaker's policy that you will abide by. Go jump in a lake. Uh, that's not what I really like to say. Okay, carry forward. You have so many conflicts yourself. You're such an arrogant SOB. Uh, Mrs. Carrie, okay, okay, don't insult me and don't take my time. Okay, move okay. forward. 7,194,674, 2022-2023, you're showing your very evil side, operating previously approved 2021-2022 to unused debt service to offset public facility revenue bonds debt. We still have the debt on the 2002 Convention Center. Everyone should pay to use the Convention Center. You shouldn't waive it for um, Chamber of Commerce and other people. It's not even due to be paid until 2028. And as stated, uh, Ms. Wilson and Mr. Davenport at the time have stock in town bank. You know, you, you have conflicts, y'all aren't abstaining. And, you know, I'm making notes of all of the human rights and civil rights abuses. Just because I haven't uh, filed anything doesn't mean that I don't object to the way I'm treated, the discrimination and your rude, evil comments. Thank you. Mayor, that's all the speakers. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. I have a second. Second. Discussion? Yes. Yes, Jeff. I would like to uh, preface the context of this. We had a discussion. Sorry, could you, you turn may, your microphone on? We had a discussion, you may recall, about how we're going to get a briefing in October. October 11th, I believe the date is because we want to get this comprehensive look of what our financial status is, what our debt obligation is, what the program funding profiles are, what the school's projected revenue formulas would be in the future, and we're going to get this baseline look at our capital improvement program. Secondly, we've yet to get the ending fund balance validated so we know what our budget surpluses were. So this resolution really has two parts for the public. One part is easily understandable. It's the traditional carrying forward of expenses we know we have, like leasing of buying garbage trucks, and we've made the obligation, but the bill hasn't come due. But I want to invite your attention, though. The part that drives my concern, and possibly a substitute resolution, is on the back part when it says, in addition to the traditional carried forward request, that's the seven million. The agenda item at the title didn't include the dollars of $5,399,212. If you notice, that dollar amount was listed later down onto the second whereas, so that's the tracking. In the remaining, in the general fund, this is now the unrestricted general fund from last year, not the current budget year, but from last year, in the amount of $5,399,212. Normally, if we didn't take this action, when they did the budget, this would show up in the what? The budget surplus, because it would be appropriated, but not expended. Now, the purpose for which it would be expended has now gone away. So now this is now this $5.4 million would be part of the ending fund balance that we would see available for this council's adjudication during reconciliation that we do, whether we're going to what? Return it back to taxpayers, we're gonna you know, share it with the schools, or, what, or we're gonna use it for capital improvement programs. That's a policy discussion in a holistic manner. But we're not doing a holistic manner reconciliation because this recommendation is, before we know how much ending fund balance there is, we're gonna reduce it by $5.4 million, and we're going to put it into the current CIP as PAYGO. In fact, it really talks about for future, the PAYGO could be next year. Now, you may recall when we adopted, or the budget was adopted on May the 10th, we already took $22 million of yet unrealized but anticipated labor savings 
and programmed it into the follow-on year of the CIP. So we've already banked $22 million of underperformance in this year into the CIP next year. I believe that while this may be the right recommendation from the city manager, it's premature to make it until after we have heard the October 11th presentation and have a chance to look at what are all the competing demands for $5.4 million, some of which may be tax refunds to the public who's suffering from at least a 3.1% reduction in earning power, and they're, and they're bearing a somewhere between four and $600 a month additional real cost. So I'm hoping that I can find favor with my colleagues not to say this isn't a good idea to do this, but this is the wrong night to be doing it, and we should do this decision on October the 20th, Mr. Mayor, at the same time we're gonna be dealing with that school issue. So we're not really saying we're not going to do it. I've talked with the manager. It doesn't have to be done tonight. It doesn't keep us from balancing our books and it doesn't take away our decision making, but I would propose that we just carry forward the 7,194,674, which makes sense to me, that's what we've done traditionally, but this is a non-traditional approach and that we address the balance of that $5,399,212 on October the 20th and discuss it at our October 11th meeting and if that is the pleasure of the body to support that, I would. Otherwise, I will just register a no vote. I'm not gonna make a substitute just to mechanically take time, but I want the public to realize that we're making obligation to put money someplace before we know what all the priorities are, and we're making a one-of-one -one decision in favor of this without knowing the opportunity cost of what this is that we're doing. I don't think that's prudent fiduciary decision making and I can't support it. Okay, we have a motion on the floor in a second. Any other discussion? The vote is open. Here, just a second, please. That's fine. The vote is open. Ms. Miles, Mr. Tower, may I have your vote? Mr. Tower, may I have your vote, please? Thank you. By a vote of eight to two, you have approved the ordinance. Oh, thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, we're going to open a hearing on planning. And uh, the first one uh, is Damneck Associates LLC for modification of proffers to a con uh, conditional rezoning of multiple family development at 872 Dam Neck Road, District 5, formerly Princess Anne. If you will uh, just state your name for the record, we don't have you signed up as the applicant. Attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of council. For the record, my name is Rob Beeman, local land use attorney with the Troutman Pepper Law Firm, here today on behalf of the applicant, Dam Neck Associates, LLC. Uh, this application involves an approximate 40-acre parcel located on Dam Neck Road, just east of General Booth that was originally zoned A18 back in 1994, subject to a series of proper development conditions for a multifamily uh, residential development. The applicant does not propose any change in density, but proposes to modify the site plan to accommodate current site conditions uh, together with current code uh, regulations. The proposed changes would allow us to decrease the footprint of the overall site from 32 buildings down to 10 buildings, would allow us to avoid floodplain and wetlands uh, impacts, and would also allow us to meet current stormwater codes with a relocated and expanded stormwater pond. Um, other than the amendments that are proposed as part of this application, the 1994 proffers would remain in place and would still govern the site, including those that require pedestrian connectivity with adjacent properties, enhanced entryway features, and also the provision of certain on-site amenities. And with that, we thank you for your consideration of this application. We'll stand by for questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. We have Thank a few you. speakers opposed here. Um, Mary Panula is the first speaker. Mary Panula. Joanne Little. Barbara Messner.
you know, there's no reason why we can't have uh, the votes over there to look at. And it's a 9-2 supermajority on $7 million. Okay. Uh, Damneck Associates modification of proffers, uh, rezoning to a multifamily development. We have high density all over the city. Traffic is a nightmare. I come from Oceana General Booth. You've done absolutely nothing about the speeding, the reckless driving. Um, you know, air police, fire, and rescue work 24-7. You don't do anything about people who speed. Uh, we don't need any more multi-family projects in, the, in this corridor. Until you fix the problems with flooding, trash pickup, pollution, and, um, you know, we don't have an, a real evacuation in case of emergency. Uh, so I'm, I'm opposed in um, rezoning. You have a new person in zoning. You're not taking care of the city, and you're not taking care of the residents. And like I said, um, Mr. Bellucci, I'm a speaker. There were, th there were three people opposed to that project. Uh, myself, Beth Allen, and some other lady, we worked on Vanguard Landing. There's a lot of files if you'd like to review it so you're informed since you're on uh, economic okay, development yeah, now. Please stick to the, you know, the subject you're supposed to be talking about. That was the previous item. I'm aware. That's all the speakers, sir. Uh, is this five or is it the same? Okay. Okay, is that everybody? Anybody else? That's all the speakers. All righty. Ready to move forward. Okay, Damn Neck Associates. Um, do we have a motion? Um, I do just want to clarify something uh, with Mr. Jahan. Uh, okay, this was this rezoning was actually done in 1994, and so they are just reallocating on the lot the, the zoning that they already have. But I notice in uh, the background, you indicate that uh, when when the um, rezoning was put to record in 2004. Uh, it was discovered that instead of 43.36 acres, there are only 41.42 acres. And it says that while the applicant proposes to maintain the same number of units approved in 94, further review of the acreage discrepancy may result in an adjustment of the ultimate number of units. So are you saying that there, there is the opportunity to adjust it to what the actual acreage is, was that original rezoning done by acre? <coughs> yes, ma'am. It would, it would be to assure that the, um, the final layout and the final acreage is, that's given to us by the engineer matches the designation of the A18 that's on the property. So to assure that it's a, a no more than 18 units per acre. Okay. So since this is not a, a new rezoning of agricultural land. This is just a modification of conditions of a rezoning that was actually done in 1994 and reallocates the uh, units on the property uh, according to today's uh, regulations. Uh, I'll move approval. Second. Okay. And any other discussion? Yes. Yes, John. I want to turn to, and I'll have some questions for staff in just a moment for this background. Looking at considerations, you're correct. It is everything the same except they're asking or have sought and have received approval to go to 1.5 parking spaces. So I went and asked some questions, but I also asked about some recent apartments that we've approved for 836. You can think of the Witch Duck Will property, which we just recently talked about, was, was 1.81 parking spaces per unit. Then as you go over to that very attractive apartment complex over on Wesleyan Drive Apartments at 1.94 spaces per unit. Now in approving this 1.5, this is the narrative that the public reads. And I did read the parking study and I remember the, the going over that a light parking study on Willis Wayside was given by an independent evaluation engineering firm and that process has been withdrawn. 
Then it said, this site is within a half a mile distance of shopping center, retail establishment, schools and parks, all of which are connected to sidewalks. In addition, the sidewalk is in close proximity to Hanford Road Transit. Uh, Mr. Tahan, do you know how many people use transit route 33? Sorry, Councilmember Moss, could you have your microphone on? Tell the folks in, in okay. listening to television but, can't hear you. But Mr. Tahan, do you know how many people use riders are on transit route 33? No, no, sir, I do not have that in front of me. Do right you now. know what percentage of people use public transit in all of Virginia Beach? It's in the executive budget summary. <coughs> Off the, off, the top, off the top of my head, no, sorry, I don't have No, and it wasn't on the parking study either. Uh, now, does any of these things talk about how any of these things have to do with the reduction in car ownership? The fact that I live across the street from a shopping center or I live near a sidewalk, that somehow that reduces car ownership? Do you have any correlation that, or cause-effect relationship analysis that shows that that has any impact on car ownership? Not directly to that information, no, sir. Do you know that we have more cars and motorcycles in Virginia Beach than registered drivers? Uh, Mr. Moss, I this, think civility questions. starts at this dais. It does. I'm asking questions. Well, you know, I, I, I'm asking questions. Yeah. I'll ask them as nicely as I can. Oh, that, that would be wonderful. So what I'm trying to get to is when you read this, on what basis did we draw the conclusion that 1.5 is sufficient? if we aren't in possession or the person that makes those approvals isn't in possession of that kind of information and can make a conclusion as to how those criteria, which I didn't make this up, this is, you know, you're writing from the staff and can't tell me how it impacts car ownership. And I only mention that is because when you drive around the city and look at apartments that are 1.5, and I did that, Plaza and Pembroke, cars are all over the streets because there's not enough parking in the apartment complexes. So I'm just trying to understand how we get the 1.5 here. And I further ask, and I go here, is that how many, if they had to live with the actual parking standard, how many units could be built? It was 518 was the answer that you gave. And I, and I appreciate that answer, it was very timely. So I think what's happened here, this is just my view, is I understand stormwater management regulations. You can't build in the wetlands to start with. They want the original number of units. They got to get it in a smaller space. So they're going to higher elevation, which I went and looked up about, you know, how you can go to five stories with this other fire treated wood with a two hour burn standard and various different types of construction. I researched all that myself. So I understand that. But I don't come back and say, how do we get that 1.5 parking spaces was enough? And when I asked you about that, you said, well, there was going to be some commercial development. You may recall that conversation. And there may be a shared parking arrangement with the commercial development. But the commercial development isn't before us. And the shared parking arrangement isn't before us. But 1.5 parking spaces is, and the analysis doesn't support it. Maybe all you people read these things and think this makes sense, but when you go and look at the city's own data, which is readily available, you can't draw the conclusion that sidewalks accessible or transit being accessible or a shopping center being accessible reduces car ownership. So I, I think it's a, a flawed approval. I don't think the facts of reality bear it out. I'm only mentioning it because I'm not voting for it, and I want the public to know that the narrative that we get isn't supported by reality on the ground, and I don't understand why we approved it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? The vote is open. Sorry, my background. Front was, mic wasn't on. By vote of nine to one, you have approved the application. All right, moving on to item number four, Atlantic Park Incorporated and Virginia Beach Development Authority, Virginia Beach Development Authority for a modification of compliance for a four 70-foot light poles and one 60-foot light pole 
within the surf park facility located a block bordered by uh, Arctic and Baltic Avenues, 19th and 20th Streets, and double block bordered by Pacific and Arctic Avenue and 18th and 20th Streets, you know, Beach District. Speaking. Uh, yeah. We have, well, Mark Stevens. And the applicant, I mean, if you'd like to speak for the, for the applicant. Okay, perfect. So, Mr. Stevens, you're first then. Thank you. And after Mr. Stevens is um, Barbara Messner. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Good, sir. Thank you very much, um, Council, Rosemary, and Bobby. I appreciate all the work you've done with this and Linwood and Guy. This is a great project. I live on 21st Street. I have a business within walking distance also this project. This project will change our neighborhoods and I'm excited to see this project move forward. So I hope you support these changes they're asking for, for this project to move forward, break ground, and let's have a great oceanfront down there. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Barbara Messner is the next speaker, and then Kate Pittman. Okay, I've attended all the meetings on the dome site. This is probably from 2015, and it's been called the surf park. Um, Kelly Slater's the only one that has a working skate park. You said somebody else designed it. It's a partnership with Venture, Town Bank, Napolitanos, and there's major conflicts. Y'all don't bother to bring up, you know, the conflicts in Mr. Branch, your hotel's right around the corner. Uh, major conflict, you know, to have more entertainment for your hotel. Uh, this is for the 70-foot light poles and one 60-foot light pole within the surf park facility. Um, our entire resort is commercialized. That was air municipal parking lots. That land is supposed to be for resident parking. It's not supposed, and the dome site, it won, one of your designs, since it's historic land, you know, had some folded dome thing on top. This doesn't, you know, all these things don't have it. Plus, you're building a parking garage, you're taking away, I think it was at least 500 uh, parking spaces. So, um, yeah, and your free rides, your free rides all over the oceanfront, HRT, buses, rolling billboards, 500,000 500, for each trolley, that, and the, the free rides go from uh, the Cavalier, which you subsidized, to the... Um, Ocean Breeze and the Campgrounds, which is a partnership with Venture again. So there's multiple, multiple conflicts. And, you know, you can't even walk across the streets and you're, what's the definition of graffiti and what's the definition of your biased uh, painting everything, streets, buildings, it's, it's disgusting. Um, I only have 19 seconds, so I'll, I'll wait on the next item. The last speaker is Kate Pittman. Hey, welcome. Good evening. It's quite the introduction. Um, I'm a representative of the Vibe Creative District. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, and City Manager. We have met with Venture staff and reviewed this lighting plan. They have been transparent with our Creative Business District, and we believe that it's necessary and important to have appropriate lighting over such a large body of water. So thank you for supporting that. Oh, thanks so much. That's all those speakers, sir. Okay, great. At this point, do we have Move to a motion? Approve. 
We have a motion to approve. to approve. And a second. Any other discussion? I just, I just want to make one comment. I got a chance to walk the resort neighborhoods a couple of weeks ago. And Mark, you're dead on the excitement around those neighborhoods of transforming this wasteland into this, bringing a little bit of town center to the resort. It's palpable down there. And we just can't wait to get it under construction. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Votes open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have approved the application. All righty. And then uh, I guess the final item uh, before appointments would be Atlantic Park uh, Beach Development Authority for uh, major entertainment venue sign located at block border by Arctic and Baltic 19 and 20th Streets and double block border by Pacific and Arctic and 18th and 20th Streets. Yeah, in District 6. Speakers? Uh, yes. Uh, Mark Stevens? You, okay. Barbara Messner? As I've stated many times, I've lived in Virginia Beach 40 some years. I lived on 24th Street. And I've, we used to have a safe city. We used to have parking for everyone. And I object to the development authority, which has debt. Um, you know, y'all work, work in partnership with planning. You appoint and pay economic development. And Taylor Adams is a city manager and director of economic development. Mr. Holcomb is a sheriff. And he's on city council, which is a conflict. But yeah, Like I said, this is 2015. It's not as if few people bother to show up anymore. But at the time, Mayor Sessoms, who's part of uh, Town Bank, Rosemary Wilson and Ben Davenport had stock in Town Bank. Um, yeah, the city of Virginia Beach had $1.384 in unfunded liabilities. That was in 2015. Uh, Michael Levinson and others on council appointed to economic development stockholders at Town Bank. Um, yeah, the conflicts are unbelievable and your votes are outrageous. And I just want to take a picture. And I'd like to know why the, uh, since I've asked multiple times of the clerks and communications, why that, um, that sign isn't on both sides. Why are there two du duplicate signs? And why can't we see who's voting? It stays on like 10 seconds. So you violate all due process. <coughs> I'd like to say. Okay. I'd like to say Rosemary. something. So twice tonight, Ms. Messner has said I have stock in Town Bank. I, I wish I did. <laughs> uh, I don't have any stock in Town Bank, and I don't know where she's got her information. Uh, it would be nice to have, but uh, and I think Town Bank is a, a wonderful institution that does a lot of great things for our community. But I don't have any stock. We have one additional speaker, Kate Pittman. Okay. She has declined, so, Mayor, that's all the speakers. She's still here. She, she's she's decided she doesn't want to speak. Okay. So that's all the speakers. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. Okay, Second. any discussion? Let's open the vote. Okay. 
Vice Mayor Wilson, may I have your vote, please? Thank you. By a vote of 10 to 0, you approve the application. Okay, thank you. Madam Vice Mayor, do we have appointments? We do. We do. Don't talk. So, um, <clears throat> Community Organization Grant Review and Allocation Committee, we uh, want to reappoint Lori Zantini. The Historical Review Board, we would like to reappoint Charles Hightower. The Minority Business Council, uh, we want to reappoint Damian Watson. The Open Space Advisory Committee, uh, we're going to reappoint Clay Burnick and Vincent Bowers. The Public Library Board, we're going to appoint Marguerite Durand, Calvin Jackson Green, Alexander McDaniel, and to reappoint Helena Jordina Thorpe for one year one-year term. For Tidewater Community College, we're going to appoint Wanda Cooper. For Tidewater Youth Services Commission, um, Alfred Stewart and Gregory Smith. And that's it. Okay. Um, vote is open. Mayor, give us a second. Vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have appointed those read by Vice Mayor Wilson. Okay, do we have any old business? Any new business? We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. All right.